Grand Valley to South Texas, about 50 miles west of the Atlantic Ocean and about a mile and a half north of the Mexican border in the beautiful Rio Grande River, aka the Rio Bravo. I'm showing you uh, just extensive agricultural fields. You know, it smells kind of farty. Air smells like somebody broke wind. You can see they got the, they got some uh, brassicas over there. I think they're growing Brussels sprouts. That's where the fart smell comes from. Anyway, I'm showing you this to sh just to give you an idea of what the land has been turned into now versus what I'm going to show you, uh, which is what it was, uh, you know, for basically the past 100,000 years up until about 100, 120 years ago. Uh, anyway, thankfully, a little sliver of the original habitat was left, but this is just... This is mostly what it is now. If you go a little bit further north, it's just like a retail slum. Just endless shopping and parking lots. Pretty bleak. But anyway, we're going to take a look uh, at some of the beauty that once was. Here we go. Okay, here we are. We're about, I don't know, maybe half a mile from the Mexican border in the Rio Grande over there. This is a type of habitat it's called Tamalipan Thorn Scrub. And you can see the dominant trees, uh, right here at least, are Prosopis. You also get a, a species of elm and... Uh, Another uh, member of the Fabaceae, the pea family. You can see, I mean, it's just uh, kind of just a little less scrubby habitat, you know. And uh, this, of course, is all clear for agricultural fields. A lot of biomass here, uh, you know, a lot of plants with thorns, plants with uh, toxic exudates, uh, plants that uh, pr produce very bitter compounds in their leaf tissue, and a lot of plants with the small leaves. And anything that doesn't have small leaves is, of course, going to have a lot of hairs in it and be a pretty uh, tomatose and pubescent. Take, for instance, uh, this abutilon, Malvaceae, Mallow family. There you go. There's uh, the unopened, uh, the unopened flower buds. A lot of species in its genus down here in South Texas. I think there's like 15 species. Here's another uh, little aster family member. Talk about compounds. This guy, this guy stinks. I kind of like the way he stinks, though. This is Fleischmannia. Little discoid flowers. Look at those prominent styles poking out of every little, every little individual floret. No daisy rays. That's why they're discoid. Leaves the opposite. Stinky bastard right here. Let's see what else we got. Hey, here's a nice one. This guy's everywhere. Chromalina odorata. Eupatoria tribe of the sunflower family Asteraceae. Got to be careful. You get three other species that look a lot like this. With those purple style branches, those long ass style branches, so indicative of the Eupatorias. You know, Eupatorias, of course, Joe Pie Weed. You get up in the Midwest, a lot of them can be up, you know, up to six or seven feet tall. You get a lot in Mexico, too. Anyway, you got three species that look like this down here. As with the, any member of the sunflower family, you don't just take a picture of those flowers like that. That doesn't tell you nothing. You really got to get those phyleries, those roof and shingle bricks uh, that, that surround the involucre. So get some pictures that they're diagnostic. Get some pictures that they, get some pictures of the leaves. You know, are they uh, opposite, alternate, whatever the shit. Anyway, there you go. Chromaline odorata. Real nice one. Okay, this is kind of interesting. Look at this. In this Celtis, Hackberry, Cannabaceae. Same family as uh, cannabis. You got these, uh, you got these little mollusks. Now, do you like mollusks? Huh? This is a genus, a species in the genus Rhabdotus. And they're like a desert adapted snail. It's not really, I guess it's a desert here. You go west, it starts to become more of a desert here. It's just like I said, the thorn scrub. They get a little bit too much rain and a little bit too much humidity in summer to really be considered a desert. But of course, this is, a, you know, this is like peyote, peyote territory, especially if you go a little bit more west where it starts to dry out a little bit more. Anyway, that aside, this little bastard, he's basically in a state of dormancy. They crawl up here, you know, they hang out, and then they seal themselves off and just basically wait for the rain. They seal themselves out from the atmosphere, create a little seal in there. So he's like living in a can in his little bomb shelter, just like all the preppers and shit in Oregon who are, you know, give, you know, kind of freaky and, uh, you know, just think they can live in a, a little uh, sealed can in the ground while the rest of the world goes on and, you know, whatever. Anyway, hey, it's kind of weird. Let's not talk about that. Anyway, here's the, here's the Rhabdotus. You can see he's just hanging out. This is an important food source for the roadrunners and a goddamn, uh, uh, some of the hawks and some of the, uh, the other little critters and shit that you see around. And there's there's quite a few of them, you know. If you get good habitat, you get quite a few of these little mollusks. Oh, you could just smell all the terpenes and other shit coming out of the stomata. And basically the exit, it's this abutiline. This is all abutiline right here. Cotton family, Malvaceae. Look at those palmate leaves and shit. And you got the, got them growing beneath the canopy of Parkinsonia, Aculeata, P family, Fabaceae. Isn't that nice? Look at that. 
Anyway, speaking of abutilon, I want to show you this real quick. Again, there's like 15 species of abutilon down here. This is abutilon trisulcatum. Got to look at that stem. You can see it's got the tree angles on it. Okay, easily confused with fruticosum. But uh, you can see right here, you got big leaves. And that's it over there, too. It can have large leaves. But one of the adaptations to growing in an arid area is that it can also drop those leaves, stay alive, and then uh, produce much smaller leaves uh, when it hasn't rained in a while. So it's a pretty wonderful adaptation. You can see it's got these tiny leaves too, and then uh, big leaves, uh, big leaves up here. So it just depends. You know, it's it's a uh, basically got a good response mechanism. It's been here long enough. It's evolved these uh, character traits where it can just, uh, you know, basically the size of the leaf that it has at any one time is dependent on, uh, you know, whether it's got enough moisture in the ground at present or not. Okay, now, now this is nice. Remember I say you go west, it starts to dry out a little bit. The further you get from the gulf and those warm ocean currents and all that humidity and what this shit that causes the rainstorms, the further west you go, the more desert-like it becomes. Yet here we're still close enough to the gulf, only about 50 miles away, we get enough humidity that you can get Spanish moss, which isn't a moss at all. It's actually a bromeliad related to pineapple, Pelangia usneoides, and it's dangling off this species of elm, Ulmus crassifolia. They call it the cedar elm. There's the leaves right there. Again, it's uh, like, you know, most elms tend to be. It's deciduous at the moment. It's dropped most of its leaves, but you can see there's the leaves. Pretty scabbers. Feels kind of like sandpaper. And note that it's not perfectly even on one side. That is one of the uh, leaf bases is a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, flexed out to the uh, outside uh, of uh, than the other, the other uh, side. So it's not symmetrical. Anyway, there you go. But a true elm, almost crassifolia. How about that? There you go, there's a young and it didn't drop all his leaves. He didn't drop all his leaves yet. Of course, you come here and some of them are all green, they're gone off. You know, pretty nice. Look at all the fucking buffalo grass, too. Kind of a pain in the ass. There you go, there's some nice, uh, uh, prosopis. You can see, look at the color of that. That black, all the black and you got some whites up there. That black is all bacteria. It's a relatively harmless bacteria. Uh, not sure if it's causing sap to be exuded from that mesquite or if the mesquite is itself uh, just exuding sap from insect damage and the bacteria is just an opportunist. Either way, it looks kind of gross, but it's not that bad. Looks kind of gross, but it's not that bad. You could say that about a lot of things. I'm going to keep that in the back there. I'm going to use it again today. So if we're talking to Lanceus, we're talking trichomes, trichomes, trichomes. A lot of these weed guys, and bless their hearts too in their own special way, think that trichomes only apply at the cannabis sativa, but of course they don't. You know, uh, almost every plant lineage it has a couple members that produce, produce trichomes. Sometimes the trichomes are sticky and have glands like cannabis. Sometimes they're just hairs, you know. Sometimes, like uh, Talanzia, those uh, trichomes assist in uh, uh, absorbing moisture from the atmosphere, being that if you look up, this plant basically has no roots at all. So, uh, you know, each little segment that is can absorb its own moisture. What you're looking at right there is a fruit on top of a flower. That fruit is about to dehiss. The flower is gone. The petals are gone. And, uh... You know, it just uh, disperses a little fluffy seed that gets carried on the wind, lands on something else, and then uh, takes off. Anyway, Talanzia usneoides, wonderful plant, lots of biomass, you know, sucking a lot of shit out the atmosphere, you know. Real nice plant, but again, they need the humidity, you know. They need the humidity. You get Talanzia recrevada on the Baja coast, just south of uh, San Diego, you know. Growing on a cactus and shit, if you go far enough south, they need humidity. It can be oceanic fog or it can just be a humid environment like a hot as balls, South Texas. Hey, look, the abutilon's going off. Look at those tiniest flowers. Anyway, okay, I want to make this, you know, these little bits just brief, just real short. Just say your piece, say it loudly, puke it out, and then get it over with, fucking move on. You know, like, like a decent punk song. I don't want to be here pu punishing you with these long-ass rants. Anyway, fuck it, here we go. So there you go, there's Lucana pulverulenta, bipinnate leaves, Fabaceae, pea family, almost kind of fern-like, you know, if you're, uh, you don't know much about plants. This guy grows all the way down to Oaxaca State, Mexico. I think you get a little bit in Florida, uh, and then you get another Ulmus crassifolia, just covered in Talancia, deciduous because it's the winter. And then over here, we got this, this plant, which looks like four or five other unrelated plants in this area, in that it has uh, spatulate leaves, uh, you know, in a fascicle, you know, just a really kind of, you know, you, you couldn't just take a little bit more time, you know, fuck around with those alleles a little bit, see what you got in that gene bag, and come up with a, a more pretty leaf uh, architecture, so my obnoxious ass could, you know, uh, be more enthralled with, you know, there I go, thinking like a human, thinking just, it's always got to be about me, you know, just like every other human being, always got to be about them, 
anthropomorphize any issue. Anyway, here we go. Uh, this is Cideroxylon celestrinum sapotaceae, uh, similar uh, similar uh, distribution to that uh, Lucana. As it grows in uh, you know South Florida, you get it uh, in Mexico a little bit, but it's mostly a subtropical tree. Real nice and leathery texture, huh? How about that? Okay, anyway, come to the t time of leaping thorn scrub if you want to get fucked up, okay? Because this the convergence here, this just looks like exactly like the plant I just showed you, but it's not. This is Phalothamnus spinescens acantha carpaceae. And, uh, you know, it's just the same thing. Sp uh, spatulate leaves in a fascicle with barely a petiole. You got to look at leaf texture. You got to look at, a, you know, the, the, basically the shape. I mean, it just there's it comes down to just such minute differences it's really aggravating you know it's really enough to drive you up a wall then come over look at this guy barely a petiole on this to also spatulate leaves leaf texture is a little bit different this is diasporos a pain in the ass huh now you're gonna need a therapy appointment after this holy shit oh isn't that nice even with an understory of completely non-native invasive grasses and bullshit that tend to choke out all the wonderful uh, uh, array of uh, native species we have here this is still a beautiful scene right there look at that huh Look at it. Just the Tillandsia just striping off. That's a rather large uh, cedar elm, too, huh? I mean, you, it's hard to be around Tillandsia usneoides. And I remember this when I used to be uh, in and out of Louisiana. Like, it's, it's just a fucking gorgeous plant. It really is, you know? Uh, any of the Tillandsias. You got Tillandsias in your life, you're doing good. You can't really, you know, even if you just got one that you're slowly murdering on the fridge. You know, it's in one of those corny seashell magnets. Your aunt gave it to you. You got a Tillandsia in your life, able to keep it alive for a little bit. You're doing good, you know? You know? You might be an alcoholic on the side. Might be addicted to uh, benzos. Might have antidepressant issues. Might be sorely in need of therapy, but you got a Tillandsia. You're doing okay. There we go. Look, so this this Lucana, he's bleeding up there. He's bleeding, and then he's dripping some of this, this, the goop on it to Lancia. Again, that black color, so it's due to, well, first it looks like it's, of course, the sap coming up, but then the, probably the bacteria get at it, just, you know, uh, you're secreting enzymes, eating it, and what the shit, and then you get that nice black color. But uh, the tree appears to be fine. It doesn't seem too bad. Or it could be a fungal infection. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, I shouldn't open my fucking mouth. I don't know. But something's going on up there. Interesting to pay attention to. Ah, it smells like blackstrap molasses. It's kind of sugary. It's kind of sweet. So I'm going to guess it's mostly, uh, you know, just the uh, sap. You know, all the carbs and what the shit produced in photosynthesis coming down the phloem. And uh, maybe, you know, somebody, uh, a little bug or some shit got into it. Or it could be a fungus, I guess, causing a canker, which then uh, the bacteria is uh, opportunistically feeding on. Hey, who knows? Oh, look at those guys. Just hanging out in the Tillandsia. I think they were trying to bang earlier. Oh, that's pretty nice. You know, it's hard to have any homicidal thoughts, you know, about your boss or your neighbor when you're looking at something like that. You know? Now, of course, I'm being hyperbolic. I don't really endorse kill. Well, some people maybe. Anyway, let's not talk about that. But you know, the the literalists out there can be a real pain in my ass. They really fuck everything up. You know, they ruin the whole satire thing. They ruin the whole uh, uh, hyperbole thing. You know, you get a lot of literalists, especially in California. It kind of fucking drives me nuts. A lot of people just can't take a fucking joke, and they can't just shut the fuck up. Anyway, look at that beautiful scene right there. Huh? You ever see a uh, uh, couple butterflies that are trying to bang? Maybe they're going to have a treeway. Who knows? Anyway, there you go. Zebra heliconian. Host plant is a passion flower. It's a species of passiflora. But look at this guy. He's got a torn wing. So he's stuck there. He can't move. Hopefully he's already banged, you know. He's already got it out. I don't know, you know. Kind of a drag. They're just hanging out there for now. We'll see. All right, there's there's the passion flower that they eat. That's, that's the host plant form. This is a passiflora species. But I want to show you this guy over here. So this this was a dominant tree. Used to be uh, pretty common here. And then, uh, you know, once the land got uh, destroyed and paved over with Walmarts and, uh, you know, uh, slash and burn agriculture, uh, these kind of had to go. This is a Sabal Mexicana, the, the sable palm. You know, pretty cool plant. They're, they're basically, you know, they were once widespread, but they're just stuck on a couple islands. You know, little islands of vegetation. 
not literal islands, just islands of habitat left amongst the sea of human garbage. You know, <laughs> I mean, don't want to be too much of a dark poet. I'm kind of a shitty poet anyway. Uh, in the background right there, you can see what's called an oxbow lake. They call them resacas down here. It's basically, you know, the Rio Grande's been meandering for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And as it's done so, sometimes it abandons former bends. And those that then get choked off. And they become, uh, they just become ponds. But there you go, Sabal Mexicana. Beautiful, beautiful plant. They don't get too tall, but they get pretty wide, pretty big. You know, I don't mean to be Debbie Downer. I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, when I'm talking about human garbage and stuff like that, I like garbage. I like looking through garbage sometimes, you know. You can find some good stuff in garbage. But I'm just saying, human infrastructure compared to this is garbage. And you got to keep that in mind. So, you know, maybe we shouldn't demolish all this shit just to put up our own, uh, you know, uh, retail hell, uh, cultureless wastelands, uh, you know, agriculture that's completely unsustainable and, uh, you know, needs a sturdy backing of... Uh, petrochemicals and what the shit to keep going that's just my personal opinion oh here's an interesting one you get this one going on all the way down into ecuador and not just this genus but this exact goddamn species this is malpighia glabra and it's a weird family uh malpighia you often you know you don't you don't really uh encounter it too much unless you live in a tropical or subtropical area you know you get a couple of members of the family in south texas you get a whole lot more in mexico you get them in chile just seen some down there in chile but uh, it's in the Malpighiales is the order, same order as Euphorbia. The flowers are pretty, uh, I mean, they're pretty weird. What's going on here? Okay, look at that. Five separate uh, five separate petals. Stamens look like they're conate. That is, they're fused at the bottom. Okay, and then I think you even got tree styles in there. If I can get this thing to, uh, oh yeah, you got tree styles in there. See those little tree white dots? There are three stigmas, rather, you know? My caffeine intake is not too bad today. I'm able to hold this without uh, you shaking like I got the DTs. And uh, right there, you can see you got uh, you got a weird calyx going on, too. You got little knobs on the side of the calyx. You, of course, got the green bracts, and you got those little curved banana-looking knobs on the side of the calyx. But anyway, Malpighia glabra, and it's weird they call it glabra, because if you look up at those uh, those leaves, you could just see the, the slightest little bits of hair on there. Anyway, Malpighia ACA. Same order as Euphorbias, in a pretty large uh, family. You're not going to be used to it unless you spent any time in a tropics or subtropics or even in a goddamn glass house. Let's see, get a nice money shot of that curl. Hey, there you go. Okay, on the theme of obnoxious convergence that really, you know, throws you off, throws you off, fucks you up. You know, it's like you drink a bottle of cough syrup. Compare these two, two different plants. The one I'm holding, the one here. They look a lot alike, but of course, if you get closer, you'll see that the stems aren't winged uh, in uh, this cardiospermum. Again, it's a cardiospermum. Look at those tiny little flowers. They're just so tiny. And then, of course, right here, you got a clematis. Don't got a flower to show you, but uh, also the leaf texture is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more scabrous and hairy, you know, but it's a pain in the ass. I'm not going to lie. I mean, you come out here and you look at those little hairs. You come out here, a bunch of shit does this in this region. You know, you read, you, there's some regions of the world you go to and everything looks the goddamn same. And I'm not going to lie, it'll send you to a fucking shrink. Hopefully you got a nice Jewish hippie shrink, you know, she'll keep you turned down when you're getting real turned up. You know, she lets you go and just barf it all out, you know, cursing and spitting and, and what the shit. And then she just, it teaches you how to uh, chill out, you know, take a different perspective, maybe cool down a little bit, you know. Anyway. Uh, you know, so maybe maybe that's what you got to do when you come out here. You just you got to have a script or some sort of mild sedative. Or you got to have a nice uh, a Jewish hippie shrink to talk you out of the frustration you're going to feel when you obviously, you know, when you see six or seven goddamn plants that all look the, all look the same. You know what? It's, it's actually a good thing. Everything looks like shit. It's the off season. Nothing's flowering because that gives me an opportunity to teach you how to pay attention to more of my, the minute details when you're looking at all this shit. So here you go. Here's a plant. You got the, the pinnate thing going on. You know, it's a central stem with little leaflets near your side. It's either going to be Fabaceae, the pea form family, or possibly it could be Zygophilaceae, the creosote family. A lot of the Zygophilaceae do that too. Oh, it looks like it's got some uh, insect damage, some thrifts there too. Anyway, uh, so uh, uh, you look at it, so you, let's say it's Fabaceae, right? You got another diagnostic fact you got to pay attention to is those spines, right? Definitely Fabaceae, definitely in a genus Senegalia. Now, this used to be in a, in a genus Acacia, but it was determined Acacia was polyphyletic. That was, uh, that is, not everything in Acacia uh, was uh, directly related to each other uh, via, uh, via common ancestry, via direct common ancestry. They're all in the pea family, but they don't share direct 
common ancestor. And they got a lot of differences, too. They've diverged a little bit over evolutionary time. Go fuck yourself. Anyway, so they sent a guy, when they split acacia up, uh, they split it up into five different genera. I think it was in 2012. They did the molecular work, looked at the DNA, realized it wasn't all uh, one genus. But everybody kind of knew that already, looking at the, the morphology. So when they did that, they... Uh, and split it up into a uh, Mario Sousa was one genus, Acaciella was one genus, Senegaya was one genus, Vichelia was one genus, and then, of course, Acacia was the other genus. So you got five genera there. When they split it up, one of the diagnostic factors for whether something, a lot of North American guys, at least, were in Senegaya or uh, Vichelia was where the, where the spines are. Are they stipular spines? That is, they occur at the leaf nodes, or are they just the, on the inner nodes, you know, along the stem? This is along the inner nodes, thus it's a Senegaya. This is Senegaya gregii. There you go, draped in a calculus. What a what a kind of a kind of a dirty word, huh? Calculus to and uh, you know, just they're doing this thing beneath the, a huge canopy of Spanish moss. There you go. I see him. I see what he's doing. Oh, you see him? Oh, he sees me. Oh shit! Oh no! Look at this. Look at it. Oh, he's isn't he adorable? Probably carries plague, but he's so adorable. Look at that guy. Look at him. You gotta you gotta tread real quietly, cause he's. The minute he hears you, he just dips out. You know? What's he doing? He's looking for, he's just looking for grubs foraging for little berries and shit, you know? It seems like such an exhausting life. Oh, he's fuck. oh no. He's coming to, he's coming to give me plague. Oh shit. Hey. Hey, you watch it. What are you doing? Where are you going? Really? Where are you going? Okay, there we go. You ready for some fuckery? Remember I was telling you a lot of stuff uh, looks the same. You know, you could call it convergent evolution in some cases. I think, you know, if they're responding to similar environmental conditions. Other times, uh, it's just, uh, maybe it's pure coincidence. And that might be what it is. Well, actually, I guess it could be floral mimicry. One species trying to mimic another uh, because of uh, that other species success is a pollen uh, getting pollinated but I don't know, anyway the point is a lot of shit looks the same you got to look really closely because a lot of these fucking plants could throw you off but that's part of the beauty just becoming more attentive and you should be more fucking attentive in your day-to-day -day life anyway so frick so anyway here you go looking like that chromalina odorata looking like uh, one or two other species here here we have tamalipa azuria again uh, just, you know, long-ass style branches, purple style branches, but you got to get up close. Look at those phyleries, huh? You compare the phyleries on this to the phyleries on chromalina, they look nothing alike. And, of course, this has a much longer petiole. Yeah, slightly different leaf shape, too. It's a very successful plant here. You can see it's just uh, forming a little thicket, you know, and it doesn't smell like chromalina does. It doesn't have a lot of those uh, trichomes, a lot of the same uh, secondary chemistry, the terpenes and with the shit. Uh, you know, so I guess, I guess it would be sescaterpene lactones. Still a terpene, but that's the sescaterpene lactones are what the sunflower family is famous for. And again, this is a discoid member of the sunflower family. Anyway, they go, Tamalipa azuria. Okay, here's a real interesting plant, Solanum arianthum, nightshade. They call it potato tree. You can see it's uh, it's obviously the uh, same genus as potato, of course, Solanum. But of course, Solanum is a massive goddamn genus. You can see you get that nice uh, indumentum on the leaves. They're pretty hairy, lots of trichomes, rather large fruits. Even a calyx on those fruits is a pretty, pretty hairy. Oh, yeah, look at all those scales in the, <laughs> all those goddamn scales and hairs. Anyway, I guess this has a lot of use in traditional uh, herbal uh, medicine, indigenous medicine, and what the shit. I'm not sure what happens if you put it in your ass. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can see it's a large tree native uh, all the way from the southern United States down into uh, northern uh, South America. Oh, there we go. No, another member of the Legium uh, Phylogeny Dungeon covered in Talansia. This is Ebonopsis ebono. With those, they got those large fruits. If I could find you one over there. Yeah, there we go. See? The little, little bean pod fruits. Anyway, there's where that little uh, armadillo went. He went in there somewhere, you know? This gotta be a pretty nice life. You just hang out, eat shit off the ground. Occasionally, uh, you know, bump into some chachalac chachalacas or maybe a, a, uh, uh, you know, a crotalus or something. Hopefully, not. I don't think a crotalus would eat his ass. He's too big. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I wasn't as short as I kept it to be. I, I tend to talk a lot and rant too much, but you can go fuck yourself. I don't really care. Have a lovely rest of your day. Go fuck yourself. Bye.